speak for. Notice there's no bullets under it. Okay, I am not going to be here. That's why. And so in my place, there's an electronic babysitter, but it's more than that, okay? This is one of the best church history films I've ever seen. It's about John Wycliffe, the Morning Star of the Reformation. Very exciting film. You're going to enjoy it. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to you seeing that. John Wycliffe was a 13th century reformer in England, and uh, he was the first one to try to translate the scripture into the common tongue, English language of the people. So that's one week that's different. The rest of the weeks, I'm telling you, it's just going to be exciting. I've looked over each one. Today we're going to discuss the early church and the, the spiritual conquest of the Roman Empire. Now, next week we're going to look at Christological controversies and Augustine. Now, Christological controversies are controversies over who Jesus Christ is and how the early church worked that out. The incarnation, virgin birth, uh, the Trinity, those ideas. We're going to get through those things. Then the third week, we're going to talk about medieval Christianity, Middle Ages. Look at that span. 1,000 years we're going to cover in 51 minutes or whatever it is we're really going to have to work with. Barbarian invasions and the fall of Rome, the rise of monasteries, the papacy, the Holy Roman Empire, medieval reform movements, the Crusades, scholastic theology, corruption of the papacy, re the Renaissance. Yeah, right. Okay. We're going to get to that, and we'll do the best we can. The fourth week is that film I referred to, and you're, you're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be great. The fifth week, the Reformation, my favorite week. Martin Luther, my hero. The guy's amazing. The willingness to die for doctrine. How many of you would die for justification by faith alone? Raise your hands. I mean, really, I mean, he was willing to die for it, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, Ulrich Zwingli. How many of you ever even heard of Ulrich Zwingli? few of you. Well, you will learn about him. Personal friend of mine. Actually, it's not true. But uh, we're going to talk about the Anabaptists and the relationship to modern Baptists. And we're going to talk about the Counter-Reformation, what Rome did as a response to the Reformation, how things happened. Week six, we're going to talk about my real hero, John Calvin. I love John Calvin. I think he's an amazing Bible exegete. I'm looking forward to teaching on him. Lots of misunderstandings about him. I want to see if I can clarify. And then, my favorite people in church history, the Puritans. Again, lots of misunderstandings. If you were to do a scan in the New York Times on the word Puritan or Puritanical, how many of them would be positive? Zero. All right? We're going to talk about them. I think they're one of the greatest movements in church history. Week seven, we're going to look at modern Europe, reason, revival, and the rise of missions, the Enlightenment, philosophy, and all those things. Week eight, American Christianity in one week. Is it possible? The entire history of the church in the U.S. in one week. No, it's not. But that's not our goal. We're going to do the best we can. And then the final week is the 20th century. Modernism, militarism, missions, and postmodernism. What's going on in this amazing 20th century of ours? All right, that's a quick overview. You got it? That's it. That's You just got church history and just, just like that. All right, now, today we're going to look at the spiritual conquest of the Roman Empire. And we're going to start by getting a... Um, a running start in terms of biblical context. All right, We're going to look at a few verses because this battle between faith, the Christian faith, and the Roman Empire was already being joined in the, in the time of the New Testament. It was already starting. There are seeds of it already there. It's not hard to find. And I think the good place to start, if you have a Bible, is to look at John 15, and then we're going to go on from there a little bit. This is not a Bible study, but I want to see if we can just rooted in the scriptures. Galatians 4, 4 says that Jesus came in the fullness of time. That means at just the right time, at the right time in history, Jesus Christ entered the world. Now, we're going to see what that means tonight somewhat. We're going to see how the Roman Empire, with its structure, with its roads, with its commerce, with its laws, with its legions, was both a help to Christianity and a hindrance it was a good thing for the church and a hard thing or a bad thing for the church. We're going to talk about that today. But at the right time, Jesus Christ came. Now, in John 15, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said this. Somebody have this? If you're willing to read this, not just my, vo my voice. Somebody read John 15, 18 and 19. Orlando? John 15, 18 19. Yep. But the world is you. You know that it hates you before it hates you. If you were of the world, Okay, 
the world hates you, remember it hated me first. And if the world loves you, that's not a good thing. Well, guess what? The world did not love Christians. And we're going to talk about that. They had a terrible time at the hands of the Roman Empire. They were persecuted badly. It says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have what? Trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Isn't that great? Now let's talk about that a little more. John 18, Jesus had a trial before Pontius Pilate. Now what was Jesus accused of? What was the crime he was accused of before Pilate? That he was a king. What's the problem? Well, the Romans don't like kings that they don't set up. If there's a king they set up, they don't have a problem with it. He'll keep the peace and the taxes, will that'll be fine. But if there's a king that comes up from the people, now that's problems. And that was a serious charge that Jesus was a king. And Jesus deals with this in John 18.33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, Is that your own idea or did others talk to me? Am I a Jew? Pilate asked. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, Now this is so important for our study tonight. My kingdom is not of this world. That is so important. If Pilate and the Romans had understood that, they would not have treated the church the way they did. My kingdom is not of this world. I am no threat to you here. I'm a threat to you on judgment day, but I'm no threat to your power here and now. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, what's the sign that my kingdom is of this world? My servants would have fought with the sword to keep me from being handed over to you. That's the proof that Jesus' kingdom wasn't of this world. Jesus' servants don't use the sword to advance the kingdom. That's not how we do it. We do it through speaking the truth. All right, but my kingdom is not of this world, Jesus said. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus said, you are right in saying that I am a king. It is for this reason I came into the world. Now, I'm going to show you a little clip from one of my favorite Jesus movies, Jesus of Nazareth uh, by Franco Zeffirelli. And in this little clip, Jesus is on trial before Pilate. Now, this clip is not true to the Bible in one sense. I think Pilate was terrified of Jesus. Terrified. But it doesn't show that. But what it does show is an interesting thing. He looks over at Jesus and, he, and he's, you know, he's about to let Barabbas go. Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He was a fighter against Rome. He's about to let him go. His soldiers come around and say, you can't let Barabbas go. The soldiers won't like that. Barabbas is a threat to Rome. And then Pilate looks at Jesus and says, I wonder who's the bigger threat to Rome. So, watch this. Interesting. Is it all plugged in? We'll find out, I guess. Nope. Well, while our crack AV team is working on that, we'll just keep going. I'm going to talk a little bit about Paul as well. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 was Ananias who went to baptize him was told, go, place your hands on him and baptize him. He said, he is going to be my witness to the leaders of the Jews and also to the Gentiles and their kings. Now, who's the king of the Gentiles? Caesar, right? The Roman emperor. Paul gets arrested. He's on trial. He appeals as a Roman citizen. He appeals to Caesar. That's his right as a Roman citizen. And the governor says, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you will go. He did go to Caesar. Second Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, I am, uh, I'm being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure. I'm about to what? Die. He had no question about that. He knew he was going to die. He said, then he says, at my first defense, no one came to my support. Everyone deserted me. Now, his defense was in front of who? Caesar. That's who he appealed to. At my first defense, no one came to my support. Everyone deserted it. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me, the message 
might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles, including who? Caesar, might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Now, what do you think he means, I was delivered by, from the lion's mouth? I wasn't executed? That's not what he means. He knows he's going to die. He was delivered from Satan's attack so that he would wimp out at the end of his race. He already said, I count my life worth nothing. I, mean, I don't care if I die, but I want to finish my race. And what was the finish line? To preach the gospel to who? Caesar himself, and he did. God wanted that flag stuck in there, whether Caesar believed or not, and he did not believe. But within 300 years, Caesar would declare himself to be a Christian. That's unbelievable. you realize how shocking that is? If you had told the emperor Augustus, ruler of the known world, oh, there's a, a, a little baby being born in your realm somewhere, and uh, somewhere down the line, Roman emperor is going to declare him to be God. He never would have believed it. A Jewish baby? Emperor Constantine declared himself to be a Christian in the year 325. Are we all set? All right, we'll try. Oh, it's on. Okay. Sorry, it was on. All right, where's the remote? All right. Okay, this is Pilot. Uh -oh. Okay. Power. It uses the um, it uses that little um, coax cable. You know, you know what's really funny about AV? I came up here five times to be sure it was all set, everything set, but we had to move in, so we'll have to get back to it. Um, let's get now to a, uh, to a look at the Roman Empire itself. The Roman Empire gave unintentional aid to the growth of Christianity. How did the Roman Empire help the spread of Christianity? Well, I've already mentioned it. The Roman Empire helped the spread of Christianity through their roads, for example. The Roman roads were a marvel of engineering. I mean, think about it. We take roads for granted, don't we? But any of you who are old enough to remember when there wasn't an interstate system in the United States, you realize how hard it was to travel from state to state. And that's in the 20th century U.S. But uh, it, was, it was coax kind of cable here. All right. Oh well. Yeah. It, it, we'll forget about it. It's not important. We'll show it another time. Um, but the Roman roads were, were amazing. There was the Appian Way, which traveled for thousands of miles. Smooth. Carts could go over it. What did this enable them to do? Commerce, right? Money, trade from place to place. It also made people move around more. Haven't we seen that happen in the U.S.? With the interstate system, people move more now than they used to. They don't live in the same areas. Durham is exploding with people who are coming here and driving on these roads. And they're too narrow now. Have you noticed? <laughs> but Roman roads, very important. Roman commerce. Also Roman culture. You know, there was, a, there was a worldwide blending of culture because of the Roman Empire. It's a similar thing we're going to see again in the 20th century with the effect of World War II. Again, people come from small towns in the U.S. and go over to the Philippines and then when they get done, if they're Christians, they say, I could be a missionary. And they were missionaries. Their world was expanded because of their experiences. And so it happened with the Roman Empire. All of these helped the gospel greatly. But the Roman Empire itself was dead set against Christianity. Fought it tooth and nail. And we're going to talk about that. It says, the blood of martyrs is seed for the church. Tertullian said that. That's an incredible statement. Look at that. The blood of martyrs is seed for the church. What does that mean? How is the blood... What is a martyr? What is a martyr? Huh? Somebody who dies for the faith. Now, in the Greek... Huh? Yeah. In the Greek, the word is related to witness. To be a witness. Okay? But the ultimate witness was by somebody who was willing to die for Jesus. Willing to die. And so the Romans were killing Christians. Their blood was being shed by lions, by gladiators, by all, wild animals of all kinds. They were being burned at the stake. Their blood was being shed. And Tertullian, who is, I just love him, he's, he's one of my heroes. He was a Latin, of, he was converted at age 40. He was a lawyer. Lawyers can be Christians. It is possible. 
He was a lawyer, he, and he was the first man to write in Latin. He was really, to some degree, the father of Latin Christianity, a great writer and a defender of the faith. And he said the blood of martyrs is seed for the church. You can't beat us that way. What did he mean by that? The blood of martyrs is seed. What does that mean? You keep killing us, what happens? More pop up. You can't stop us that way. Now, let's look at some of these notorious persecutors. Nero, 54 to 68. Have you ever heard of Nero? What's Nero famous for? Fiddling while Rome burned. That's right. I don't know if he was a good fiddler or not. It really doesn't matter when your city's burning. That's the eternal city. Some people believe, even contemporaries, that he's the one that set the fire. He's the one that set the fire. But there he is fiddling on his fiddle while the, all the city burns. Well, he needed to cover himself. You see, politics haven't changed much. He needed to cover himself. And so who did he blame? Well, he blamed the Christians. It's their fault. Well, this man Tacitus who came along, I haven't given you the whole quote here, but Tacitus told us that Nero had the Christians sewn in, into the carcasses of, of animals and then wild dogs were set on them. They were ripped to shreds by packs of dogs. I mean, unbelievable, terrible t uh, tortures. But Tacitus, who hated the Christians, Tacitus was a, a Roman historian. He, he did not love the Christians, but he writes about the effect of this persecution. As a result, although they were guilty of being Christians and deserved death, people began to feel sorry for them. You see that? People would feel sorry for them. There was no sport in it. It wasn't fun to watch. They weren't like gladiators who are fighting. They were just common people like your neighbors and they're just dying. And so the Roman people loved entertainment, but this was not entertainment. This was tragic and people would turn away. People began to feel sorry for them for they realized they were being massacred, not for the public good, but to satisfy one man's mania, Nero. So it backfired on him. But you know, one generation after another of Roman emperors tried the same thing. And once Rome was done with it, other leaders have tried it, right up to the 20th century and into the 21st. It keeps going on today. And that's why Tertullian's quote, we've got to keep in mind, the blood of martyrs is seed for the church. You can't destroy the church by killing Christians. It will never work. There are better ways if you're Satan. There are three great attacks that Satan has on the church. You know what they are? Number one, what? Family. Family. Family is a, a tr an avenue of it, but he attacks the family. How, that's, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe there's four. Um, <laughs> this one you think. Number one, I think we've talked about persecution. Okay. Complacency. Okay. False teachers. Yeah. Heresy. False doctrine. And then, I, you know, I think dr drawing the family together with the complacency, we might say worldliness. Sin. Just becoming like the world. All three were in evidence in the period of history we're looking at this time. We're going to talk about two of them. Persecution is the least effective attack on the church. Why is that? What happens to the church when the church is persecuted? It, it spreads, but it also gets purified. Purified. How does the church get purified? Two ways. Fake Christians leave. And are there fake Christians? Yes, lots of them. They leave. True Christians are strengthened by it. They're strengthened. Their, their worldview changes. They start to realize Jesus is the only thing that matters. Only Jesus matters. The world is not my friend. We get forgetting that, don't we? We forget it here in America. This world is not our friend. So that persecution is the least effective way. It is effective in one sense in that powerful, strong witnesses for Christ are dead. They're not here anymore. And sometimes Satan will just pay that price. He's willing to just kill them so that they can't hurt him anymore. They realize he has to ask permission first. Can't happen unless God says so. Second is false doctrine. Of the three, this is the worst. The most dangerous. Why? Because the doctrinal ideas go on from generation to generation. They pollute people. The Apostle Paul says if somebody comes, even if an angel from heaven, or if I should come and preach a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, let him be accursed. It's very dangerous to change doctrine. That's why I'm so careful that everything that we teach comes from the Bible. The third is worldliness. Now, how do we see that? We saw the second, 
false teaching. Uh, we'll see it next time in terms of the Christological controversies. Do you realize that the Jehovah's Witnesses idea of, of uh, Jesus Christ is very old? It goes back to the second century. And they dealt with it very early on. False teachers. We'll talk about that next time. The first one, persecution, we're talking about now and will be for the next few minutes. The third one, worldliness, comes in after Constantine. When Constantine marries the government, the, the Roman government, to the church, we have real problems, and we've been dealing with them really ever since. The Crusades, all that stuff happened as a result of the marrying or the wedding together of church and state that we see there. <clears throat> okay, so those are the three. Let's talk more about persecution. Nero, we've already talked about. Demi Domitian, 81 to 96, took the title Master and God. You had to call him Master and God. Now, how does that sit with you as a Christian? That's not going to work. I mean, I'll call you Emperor. I'll call you C. I mean, lots of, but not that. That's Jesus' title. He's our Lord. He's our God. We're not going to call it. Well, then you're going to pay for it with your life. He ordered that people take an official oath to the effect that he was Master and God. Then along comes Trajan. Trajan lived, and that's not the basketball player. Trajan lived... Uh, Nine, or it was emperor from 98 to 117, and he developed the official policy of the empire toward Christians. And it was three steps. Basically, number one, acquit the repentant. All right. In other words, if you're sorry for being a Christian and repent of it, you're free, home free. Well, that may seem great, but it's a temptation, isn't it? You're in prison, you're waiting for your execution, and they say, all you have to do is say, I'm not a Christian, and we'll let you go home today. No questions asked. What a test that was. You just walk out the door any time. Number two, accept no anonymous accusations. If you're going to make an accusation, you have to stand up to it. And number three, punish the obstinate with death. If they stick to it, they have to die. This was the policy for a hundred years. Now, key martyr during that time was Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius lived around 107, and what happened with Ignatius was he was accused of being a Christian, convicted. And by the way, I've asked before, and I'll ask this again, if you're accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I've heard that before. I think about it. Well, with Ignatius, there was plenty of evidence. It wasn't hard. He was a bishop uh, in that area, uh, an important man, an important spiritual leader, and so there's no question that he was a Christian. And so he was scheduled to be executed, but they wanted to do it in Rome, because apparently some Roman general had won some important battle and they were going to have a week-long festivity, celebration in Rome. And part of that was going to, they were going to execute some Christians. I mean, Romans were strange people. It was a brutal time. But that's what they did for entertainment. And so Ignatius was going to be sent to Rome as one of the people to be executed. Well, again, there's not Lufthansa or anything. I mean, it took a while to get to Rome. It was a, there was a long time to, to get there. So how would you like to be Ignatius, traveling all that way to Rome, realizing that the end of it is death? Well, he made the most of his time, and he wrote seven letters that we still have today. That's how we know his story. One of the letters was meant to be sent on ahead of him to the church at Rome. Remember, there was a church at Rome. The Apostle Paul wrote to them. That's where we have the book of Romans, church at Rome. So Ignatius writes on ahead and says, please don't do anything to help me. <laughs> Why? Because he wants to die. He wants to be a martyr. And there was a lot of that attitude during, in the first, second, third centuries. This is what he writes. I am afraid of your love. That's interesting. I am afraid of your love, lest it should do me an injury. For it is easy for you to accomplish what you please, but it is difficult for me to attain to God. If you do not spare me under the pretense of carnal affection, for it is not my desire to act towards you as a man pleaser, but as pleasing God, even as you please him. In other words, what he's saying, and he goes on in his letter, saying, please don't do anything to rescue me. And he says later in the letter, very interesting, he says, I've gotten myself worked up to this point. I'm ready. If I don't go now, it's just going to happen four or five years down the road. I want to finish my race. I'm running the race now. I don't want to stop. I want to finish my race. And so he writes to them and asks, please don't do anything to rescue me. Then the next uh, emperor was Antoninus Pius. The key martyr there was Polycarp and Smyrna. And this is my absolute favorite martyr story the martyrdom of polycarp now smyrna you remember smyrna what do you know about smyrna it's one of the churches in revelation asia minor he was an important church leader in smyrna the church in smyrna was the persecuted church as you remember it was the one that was being crushed 
the one that was being persecuted. And Polycarp came later. This is much later now. Um, but um, this is an account from Eusebius' history of the church. Eusebius was a church historian who was a good friend of Constantine. And it was a glorious time, so he believed, for Christianity. Christianity had won. We conquered the Roman Empire. So there's a lot of triumphant triumphalism, I guess, in Eusebius' writing. But a lot of good details and good information, too. And Polycarp, the story of the martyrdom of Polycarp, is one of the great stories. I'm just going to read. This is just from this is an eyewitness account of Polycarp's death. He stepped forward and, and, and was asked by the proconsul if he really was Polycarp. This is Roman justice. They want to be sure they've got the right guy. When he said he was, the proconsul urged him to deny the charge. Respect your years, he exclaimed, adding similar appeals regularly made on such occasions. Swear by Caesar's fortune, change your attitude, and say, away with the godless. Now, this is very interesting. The pagans called Christians atheists. Why do they call us atheists? Because we didn't believe they're gods. They had gods everywhere. They had gods here, gods there. We didn't believe in any of them. You don't believe in this one? No. What about this one? No. This one over here? No. You must be atheists. You don't believe in any god. No, we do. We believe in one god. Only one. Yes, one God. So they called them atheists or the godless. Very interesting. He said, and, and this is what you had to say, away with the godless meant get rid of the Christians. That was their slogan. Get rid of them. Away with the godless. So he says, swear by Caesar and change your attitude. Say, away with the godless. But Polycarp, with his face set, looked up at the crowd in the stadium and waved his hand at them and said, away with the godless. It's amazing. He's saying, I'm not the godless. You are the godless. You have no gods. You think you have lots of them, but you're the ones that are atheists. <laughs> the governor pressed him further. Swear and I will set you free. There's that temptation. All you have to do is just say something and you're free. Go home. Execrate Christ. Curse Christ. It's all you need to do to save your life. Just say, let Christ be cursed. Can you say that? And Polycarp said, for 86 years, I've been his servant, and he's never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? I can't do it. 86-year-old man. I have wild beasts, said the proconsul. I shall throw you to them if you don't change your attitude. Call them, replied the old man. We cannot change our attitude if it means a change from better to worse. But it is a splendid thing to change from cruelty to justice. Who's he talking to there? Well, to the governor who's judging him. If you make light of the beast, retorted the governor, I'll have you destroyed by fire unless you change your attitude. Polycarp answered, The fire you threaten burns for a time and is soon extinguished. There is a fire you know nothing about, the fire of the judgment to come and of eternal punishment, the fire reserved for the ungodly. Now understand, he's taking this right out of Jesus. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do nothing to you. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's God. Fear God. Polycarp feared God more than he feared his own death. He said, all right, he threatened me with a fire that burns for a little while and soon is soon extinguished. But there's an eternal fire to come. And then he says, but why do you hesitate? Why are we wasting time? Do what you want. The proconsul was amazed and sent the herald to stand in the middle of the arena and announce three times, Polycarp has confessed that he is a Christian. Then a shout went up from every throat that Polycarp must be burnt alive. Imagine what it would be, feel like to be burned alive. The rest followed in less time than it takes to describe. The crowds rushed from their seats to collect logs and pieces of wood from workshops and public baths. And when the pyre was ready, Polycarp prayed, O Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have come to know you, the God of angels and power and all creation, and of the whole family of the righteous who live in your presence, I bless you for counting me worthy of this day and hour, that in the number of the martyrs I may partake of Christ's cup to the resurrection of eternal life of both soul and body in the imperishability that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when he had said amen and completed his prayer, the men in charge lit the fire and a great flame shot up. So Polycarp died. Now, this morning... <laughs> So how does this apply to my life? Jonathan Edwards resolved, one of his resolutions 
was that whenever he felt physical pain, to remember, number one, the pain of Jesus Christ on the cross, and number two, the pain of martyrs in their suffering. So, my son has a cough, and he came to me this morning for some sympathy. And I am a sympathetic father. I love my kids. And I said, Nathaniel, and he's, he does have a problem. We pray together, and I was gentle with him. But then I just wanted to teach him something. And we talked about this, and we talked about martyr. I said, what do you think it would feel like to be burned alive? Think about that. To have your hair catch on fire, your eyebrows. To have parts of your body burning while you're still alive. What, what would that feel like? And they especially used certain kinds of wood that it took a while. So the fire that you threaten burns for a little while and is then extinguished. Well, the little while doesn't seem like a little while while you're going through it. Terrible, terrible suffering. And so he died. I think it puts in perspective the pains we go through. It's hard for me to complain when I think about that. And all the more the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. But Polycarp gave his life for Jesus Christ. Now, the blood of martyrs is what? Seed. What do you think happened after Polycarp? The church exploded in the region of Smyrna. Many more Christians. You can't destroy Christianity that way. Then there's Marcus Aurelius. He was a Stoic philosopher, 161 to 180. Prompted traditional religion of Rome. He hated Christians because they undermined pure Roman culture. Key martyrs were Felicitas and her seven sons and Justin Martyr and the martyrs of Lyon and Venice. By the way, Justin Martyr, do you remember a few weeks ago I preached about Christmas and how Jesus was probably born in a cave? Remember my sermon? Some of you were there. Okay, anyway, um, Justin Martyr is the one who wrote about that. Okay, he was, a, he was a martyr under Marcus Aurelius. He died. Um, great stories here. Felicitas was a, was a woman, an early servant to the church who gave her full time to serving and the church supported her financially. She was a widow. She had seven sons, godly woman, courageous woman, and they threatened her with death. And this is what she said. While I live, I shall defeat you. And if you kill me in my death, I shall defeat you all the more. <laughs> I think that's great. She was so courageous. So then they decided they'd go work on her seven sons. One of them's got to crumble. One of them's got to give in. Not one of them did. All seven of them laid down their lives for Jesus Christ. They were hoping to use one of the sons to get to her because she was such a high-profile person. And all seven of them uh, were willing to die rather than do that. Then there are these martyrs of Lyon and Venice in, in, uh, or Vienne in uh, what's modern France. Um, a terrible story. Basically, the, the Christians were forbidden to go into public places. You weren't allowed to go buy and sell and all these kind of things. Talk about the mark of the beast. They weren't allowed to do those things. And after a while, they had to come out and buy things. And so a mob surrounded them and started pelting them with dirt and rocks and all this. So finally, they were arrested, this group that was out there, and brought before the governor. They tried to persuade them. By the way, once they were arrested, a number of the people gave up being Christians. They pulled away. They were afraid. They did not want to die, of course. So it had a kind of a separating effect. This one man named Sanctus, his name was Sanctus, which means holy in Latin. I don't know if that was a nickname. Um, but at any rate, he, um, he refused to give in. And all he said, you talk about name, rank, and serial number. All he said over and over is, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. That's all he would say. And the more he said it, the more enraged the persecutors got. Uh, but as he's saying that, some of the people who are kind of falling away and getting afraid, they gained courage and they came back with the group and uh, all of them were executed for Christ. But just... Uh, this is, yeah, that's a, that, that was about 200 years before that. Uh, Cleopatra and all that was around the time of Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, all that. That's before Christ. It's a different one. Marcus Aurelius was actually a pretty good uh, emperor. I mean, uh, just as emperors go, but in terms of a persecutor, he was one. Uh, Septimus Severus uh, required all to worship Saul Invictus, the sun god. And in 202, he made conversion a capital crime. And that's true in some countries today. There's some countries where if you convert to Christianity, you'll be executed. A lot of Muslim countries are that way. Key martyrs here, Origen's father. Now, Origen, we're going to find out more. He's an amazing man, one of the most brilliant men in the history of the church. Um, we'll, we'll talk about him. He had a, a, an amazing approach to the interpretation of Scripture, which I do not believe at all. But I, I'm going to share it with you. He's a brilliant man. Um, his father was getting hauled off to be a martyr. He was going to be killed. And he's a young boy at the time. And so he goes running, 
and he wants to <laughs> he wants to join his father. He wants to die with his father. His mother hides his clothes, so he's buck naked, basically. Embarrassing moments in church history. But he would not run out into the city square naked, and so his mother saved his life. It's not your time yet, not yet. <laughs> he never did give his life as a martyr, but his father did that day, uh, unfortunately. Perpetua and Felicitas, um, and, and also three men, Saturninus, Revocatus, and Seculundus, were uh, martyred at this time as well in Carthage. Carthage was in North Africa, I think in modern Libya. Um, it was early, very early, a hotbed of Christianity. It was kind of like the Bible Belt of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century. That was, that's where Augustine w- lived, North Africa. Very strong Christian area. You know what destroyed it, by the way? You know what swept through and destroyed it? Islam. It was Islam that came through and destroyed that Christian area. Um, and we'll talk about that in due time. But uh, at any rate, Perpetua and Felicitas. Uh, Perpetua was a pregnant woman, godly woman, and she was accused of being Christian. They allowed her to come to terms. She, she uh, was afraid that she was not going to get to be a martyr. And again, that was the attitude. They yearned for martyrdom. They really, really believed that they would glorify God in this way. It was like a, a crown. And I believe they're right. If you look at, in the book of, of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 11, I forget, later in the, in the 30s somewhere, it says, some were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. What does that mean, a better resurrection? Just more rewards, more honor, more glory. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, all, ta- all stars twinkle, but they don't all have the same brightness. You know, there's different levels of glory. And so they yearned for a martyr's crown. And, the, and some of them were very afraid they wouldn't get it. And she was like that. So they allowed her to come to terms. She was grateful when she gave birth in the eighth month to a healthy girl. A Christian couple adopted that girl, and now she's ready for martyrdom. She had a, a servant girl, Felicitas, who, who went with her. And then these three men as well were martyred the same day. The three men were martyred first, Saturninus, Revocatus. They were killed by beasts, very courageously, two of them. Secundulus, for some reason, no beast would approach him. I don't know why. I mean, it just, you know, the, the lion, I mean, nobody would, no beast would come close. And so he said, I don't know if it was a prophecy or whatever, but he declared that a leopard would kill him. So they went and got a leopard, and that's exactly what happened. He died by the leopard. Amazing courage. And these people had amazing courage. Then Perpetua and her servant Felicitas were put in the arena to be attacked by a ferocious cow. I don't know if they, if they provoked the thing. It was not a bull. It was a cow. Um, they provoked it and got it angry. And, you know, a cow is a huge animal. I mean, absolutely. And it started to trample these women. And they, uh, in the middle of it, her, she was hit and she was bleeding heading toward death, and her hair became disheveled. And she stopped and she retied her hair because in that culture, loose hair is a sign of mourning or of other things. And to her, this was a day of joy. And she wanted her hair bound up. And so she takes a moment in the middle of her, of her death to tie up her hair so that she can show her joy in dying for Jesus Christ. And so as they are standing there bleeding, the two of them, they bid each other farewell with a holy kiss and then they are executed with the sword. And then finally, Decius, 249 to 251, he issued an edict requiring everyone to sacrifice to gods and to burn a pinch of incense to the emperor. You've heard about this. All you had to do is just burn some incense to the emperor, a very minor thing. And in so doing, you'd be declaring that he was deity. You didn't have to say anything, just burn the incense. And if you did, you'd receive a libellus, a certificate of incense burning, I guess. Uh, and that certificate enabled you to buy and sell. And so again, the, that mark of the beast thing, it enabled you to, to, to function economically. To enable, enabled you to be a person in that town. You could buy food. You could, you could have a business. But if you didn't have the libellus, the certificate, you couldn't do these things. Now, the question is, what did the church do with those... I mean, there are different responses. We've talked about martyrdom as we've seen... But there were different kinds of apostasy. They were called the lapsi, the lapsed. The first were the libellatici. Basically, what these people did is they obtained fake certificates, forged certificates. They didn't go and burn incense. They just got their certificate other ways. So they kind of compromised, basically. They didn't stand up and say, I'm a Christian, but neither did they burn the incense either. They kind of took a middle road. And then there were these Thurificati who actually did sacrifice to the gods, but maybe they 
cross their fingers behind their back when they did it or somehow said, that, I don't mean it, but I do need to eat here. I've got a family to feed, you know, this kind of thing. And the church had a real problem with what to do once the persecution was over and it was okay to be a Christian again. And again, it went in cycles. It was strong, real strong for a while, and then it would back off and it'd be okay, maybe even for a generation or two. And so the church, well, what do we do with these people? You know, you've got the ones that, the confessors, not all the confessors, I mean, the courageous ones died, only some of them, okay? So there were some that they were imprisoned or they had something would happen to them. They might be tortured. But then there are those that managed to get out of it. And now they come back and they want to be part of your Bible study again. What do you do? And, they, and there were real problems with that. We're going to talk about that a little more next week. But uh, there was a novation s- split. I mean, some of them said, absolutely not. They cannot be part of the church. And others said, well, they've got to go through a process. X number, 10-step process. And that's where the whole confession and penitential system started. That whole thing started during that process to get people who couldn't go through the martyrdom, get them back in the church. And eventually, it's what was overturned in the Reformation. You know, a certain amount of prayers or whatever. What were you? Penance. Yeah, they had to do penance. They had to, they had to find ways to prove that they'd repented. And so that's where that whole system started. And then there were those who committed treason. The traditores, they handed over scripture to the authorities, or they handed over. Realize how valuable the scripture was back then. Do you understand that? The, the printing press didn't exist. You know that five hours ago this didn't exist? I mean, this is amazing what we can do these days. You sit down at a computer, and you use some product from Microsoft, probably, and you type, and you get out this thing, and then you go to a Xerox machine, right? And you push buttons, and out this comes. Ready-made, staple, two-sided, unbelievable what you can do these days, if you know what you're doing, all right, which I don't. I always, they were white at first, and Jason came and helped me, and they became the color I wanted. We have four drawers, and I, never mind, I don't want to waste time with that. But back then, they had only one copy of the Bible, the Scriptures. And realize also, during that time, the New Testament was being put together. It had already been written, but the canon was being formed. That was the time when the church was identifying the 27 books of the New Testament. And so that scripture was absolutely precious. And these traitors would hand it over to the authorities. It's gone. And now you don't have the scripture. I tell you, the ones that took the time to memorize scripture, they were glad they did it. They were glad they did it. You should memorize scripture too. That's another talk for another day. All right. Then another response was apologetics. This is the defense of the faith people who courageously defended Christianity. They answered the critics. Okay, because people were saying things about Christianity, things that weren't true. And these people stepped up and answered them intelligently. Christianity is a thinking religion. It's not a philosophy, but you have to use your mind. And so they were willing to... Now, now what are some of the ideas, false ideas? Well, we have, every December, we have the love feast, right? (laughs) The love feast. And the love feast has a, has a deep tradition. It's not even, it's, Moravians were not the first that came up with it. It's long before that. The love feasts were really worship times and times of celebrating the Lord's Supper. It was times when the community would come together and share things with each other and express Christian love to one another. Well, how do you think the pagan world thought of love feasts? What do you think went through their minds? Perverted, yeah. Remember what the scripture says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. Titus chapter 1. So what are their corrupted little minds thinking goes on at Christian love feast? It's like a wild orgy, basically. And since Christians called each other brother or sister, it's incestuous to boot. I mean, and, and then they have this communion in which they are, well, I don't know, I can't know how to say it. They're cannibals. They eat flesh and drink blood. Well, what is this? It's the body, it's the, the communion. The bread signifies the body of Jesus. The wine signifies his blood. They did not understand Christianity. Somebody's got to answer these things. Then there was just the, the general view of Christians that they're a bunch of lower class ignoramuses. And a lot of them were at the lowest level of society. A lot of them were slaves. A lot of them were poor people. They had to answer. Now, Justin Martyr was one of them that answered. He taught that Christianity is true philosophy. 
the logos, the, the, the word that inspires reason. That's the Greek word for word. In the beginning was the word, remember? And the word became, and the word was with God and the word was God. That word inspires reason. It became incarnate in Christ. He also wrote in something called Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. Very important, second century writing. Basically, he defends Christianity as the fulfillment, the completion of Judaism. It surpasses Judaism. And he did all the work I've been doing for the last year and showing you guys Old Testament scriptures in the Psalms, you know, all that, Isaiah. He, a lot of it's there. Psalm 22, I quoted, I quoted Justin Martyr in my sermon on Psalm 22. Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. Get the tape, it's in there. Tertullian lived 155 to 222. I've already mentioned him. He was the lawyer. He lived in, in North Africa, in Carthage. He went to Rome and got converted in Rome at age 40. Do you realize how rare it is to get converted at age 40? Very unusual. He then took that legal mind and came back and started to attack the persecution of Christians legally. He was like the Christian Legal Defense Fund. I mean, he was that guy. He was the one that defended Christianity. Uh, he, he attacked Trajan's policy. Remember what Trajan's policy was. All right, we're not going to investigate to find Christians, but if they become obvious to us, we're going to tell them to repent. If they're willing to repent, that's fine, but if not, if they're obstinate, we'll kill them. He said, if you're not going to investigate them, then how can you call them criminals? And if you are, then investigate. One or the other. You can't have it both ways. Either they are or they are not criminals. He was very sharp legally. He also defended, he wrote his apology on 197. He refuted false understandings of Christian belief and practice. He ridiculed the moral and legal absurdities by which pagans justified persecuting Christians. And what is his famous quote? You should all be able to say it by now. The blood of martyrs is what? Seed for the church. Oh, that's so important. Some of you in this room may be martyrs for Jesus Christ. I have no idea, but some of you may. And he also said an important thing. What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Do you know what Athens was? Athens was the center. Hi, it's fine. Athens was the center of Greek what? Philosophy. What is Jerusalem? The center of biblical religion. And what is he saying? What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? What does pagan philosophy have to do with true Christianity? Very important question that would come to not haunt us, but we have to deal with it for the next 1,500 years. The relationship between human philosophy and religion. Plato, Aristotle, all those guys, and how it would fit together with Christianity. We'll get to that, God willing. Final page. The final step. Christianity was a tolerated religion. They fought this battle for a long, long time, but what, what kept happening? They kept shedding the blood of martyrs. They kept shedding the blood of martyrs. What kept happening? <laughs> More Christians. Not only that, but not just with martyrs. The Christians kept sharing the gospel in kitchens, around, around the well, you know, drawing water in the marketplace. They gossiped Christ. They just went around. They, the common, it wasn't the, the leaders. They did it too, but it was the people. That's why you need to be trained in evangelism. That's the way the church grows. When the common people, when, when the church people are at the workplace, and I'll tell you this, I'm, I'm going to say it in the evangelism seminar, the workplace is the evangelism field of the 21st century. It's not the neighborhood. It's not the church. That's an old model. Bring them to church and the pastor will preach to them. Wrong. All right? I will preach, but that's not how it happens. It happens on the job. That's where most adult men and women spend most of their waking hours these days. Well, back then it was in the marketplace. It was in various places and everybody shared their faith. Well, the church just kept growing and growing and finally Emperor Galerius, who wanted very much to continue persecuting Christians if he could, contracted a painful disease and someone whispered in his ear and convinced him that it might just be the God of the Christians who's angry at him for all that he's been doing and so he grudgingly decides to change his policy in 311 and writes this this edict therefore moved by our mercy to be benevolent towards all it had seemed just to extend to them our pardon and allow them to be Christians once again and once again to gather in their assemblies as long as they do not interfere with public order. In return for our tolerance, Christians will be required to pray to their God for us. <laughs> he wants to be healed <laughs> for the public good and for themselves so that the state may enjoy prosperity and they may live in peace. You know what's interesting? God commands us to pray for these things. Isn't that interesting? And the Christians, true Christians, were praying for these things already. They had us all wrong. My kingdom is not of this world. We're not fighting you. We're, we're not any threat to your position. 
But Polycarp had it right. There's a fire you know nothing about. You better be ready for that. Listen to our message. Jesus is the only one who can save you from eternal judgment. All right, finally, the final step. Christianity, not just a tolerated or legal religion, but Christianity, the religion, the state religion. Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, was one of four competitors for the empire. One of four in the running. Well, he ended up winning. Now, before he had a vision, he was right before an important battle, he had been following Saul Invictus, the invincible sun god. That's who he believed in. But he also knew about the god of the Christians, and he stated that he had a vision the night before this climactic battle with with Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge. He had a vision, and in the vision, God told him to put the Christian symbol, the Chi Rho symbol, on the shields of all his soldiers. And if he did, they would win the battle. And so he did. And it said, it was said in, in hoc signo vinces, in this sign you will conquer. And he believed it. And so he became a Christian. Now, did he really become a Christian? It's debatable. Uh, he, it wasn't just that one event, but he wrote a lot of things uh, about his faith in Christ, so it's possible. But at least this much is true. At that point, the church and the state were wedded together. And it became official with an edict of Milan from then on. Uh, Christianity was tolerated, but within by 383, it became the official state religion of the Roman Empire. Um, all persecution of Christians would stop. The churches, cemeteries, properties returned. Constantine then embraced Christianity as the official state religion. He founded a new city in the east as the capital of the empire, Constantinople. He made an incredible impact on future history of the Western Church. We'll be dealing with Con- uh, Constantine for the next thousand years um, in, in our church history study here. He developed an official theology, kind of like you had to believe these things or you were not a Christian. That's very, that has significant impact on the way things were done. Emperor's declared faith caused thousands to flock into the church who were not really Christians. And that has a big effect as well. All right, all of a sudden the church is mixed. You know, We as Baptists believe in a believer church. To be part of us, you have to give evidence of having been born again through faith in Christ. But most churches, most Protestant churches even, but certainly Catholic church, that's not the way. You don't have to give evidence of anything. That's where infant baptism comes from, that whole idea. You're born into it. It's a societal thing. We'll talk more about that. Some responded by withdrawing and fleeing to the desert as monks, following a pattern of fasting, meditation, renunciation of the world. It's a way of dying to the world. And monasteries will, will be big. We'll talk about that later. Martyrdom is no longer possible, so they're going to do it this way. And others began working in earnest on theological writings. And Christian worship was affected by immense churches which the new wealth enabled them to build. So we've come a long way, haven't we, in just 300 years. Yeah. Crystal Cathedral and all that, it still goes on today. It's called the edifice complex. You know, if you build it, they will come. All right, why don't we close in prayer? We've gone a whirlwind tour of 300 years. Let's close in prayer and... uh, Meet again next week, God willing. Father, we thank you for the things we've studied tonight. We thank you for the time we've had to study them. And we ask in Jesus' name that you would bless our continued study. Thank you for each person who came tonight, and we pray that you'd bless them as they learn more about your, your church. Help us to be as courageous as the martyrs were, as willing to stand up for Christ as they were. In Jesus' name, amen.